Justin Peters was just here. Excuse me while I pick up that name. Uh, what were we doing together? A series of discernment lectures to create a resource that you can use in Sunday school, homeschool, whatever, to be excellent discerners. Why? We seem to have two camps in evangelical Christianity these days. People who are absolutely allergic to judging. Oh, oh, oh judge not. On the other hand, you can have a discernment <laughs> who judge everything. Neither one of those extremes is right. There are rules to the game, and it seems to me this particular lecture could be very helpful right now. We're, we're having a lot of online discussions. I think it'd be better if we had them in our local churches. I don't think it's a sin to do it publicly, but if we're going to disagree publicly, John Newton, Mr. Amazing Grace, would offer some rules for us to consider so that we don't win the argument, but end up bloody in the battle. Because discernment, if it is not done rightly, it can cause a lot of carnage. So uh, this is not gonna be released for months and months. Nevertheless, I thought it might be rather poignant uh, considering our current climate of online discussions. This is the presentation that I did with Justin Peters on John Newton's letter to another pastor who is going to engage another pastor publicly. Welcome to Thou Shalt Judge, judging publicly. There are rules that must guide us, and the man who is going to give us those rules is none other than Mr. Amazing Grace himself, John Newton. In the middle of the 18th century, he was writing a letter to a pastor who had written him a letter informing him that he was going to write a letter about another pastor and have it posted publicly in the newspaper. Did you track all of that? John Newton received a letter from a man who said, I'm going to write about this guy critically, another brother. And John Newton replied to that fellow, offering him some wisdom before you go about the business of writing a letter about another brother. Let's open up that letter from John Newton and see what we can learn about how to discern and doing it publicly. He writes to this pastor, you're on the strongest side. I think you're right. For truth is great and must prevail so that a person of abilities inferior to yours might take the field with a confidence of victory. We don't write like that anymore, do we? Our texts are like, W-Y-D, what you doing? <laughs> I'm not therefore anxious for the event of the battle, but I would have you more than a conqueror, not only over your adversary, but over yourself. If you cannot be vanquished, you may be wounded. This is why discernment, it's not child's play. We can actually hurt ourselves, even as we go about the business of discerning others, to preserve you from such wounds as might give cause for weeping over your conquests. I would present you with three considerations. There are three considerations that we're going to take a look at, and we're going to pull out Newton's rules as we go. Consideration number one. Newton said, consider your opponent. As to your opponent, I wish that before you set pen to paper against him, and during the whole time you are preparing your answer, you may commend him by earnest prayer to the Lord's teaching and blessing. This practice will have a direct tendency to conciliate your heart to love and pity him, and such a disposition will have a good influence upon every page that you write. Consider your opponent. Newton rule number one, pray before you strike. It'll help your heart. Isn't that what prayer does? It just helps our hearts when we are done. Back to our letter from John Newton. If you account him a believer, though greatly mistaken in the subject of debate between you, the words of David to Joab concerning Absalom are very applicable. Deal gently with him for my sake. The Lord loves him and bears with him, and therefore you must not despise him or treat him harshly. The Lord bears with you likewise. I have to interrupt myself. Man, I wish we would apply this rule on the internet. The Lord bears with you likewise and expects that you should show tenderness to others. 
showing tenderness to others feels like compromise, doesn't it? If I'm soft on this, if I actually sound like a gentleman or a lady, they're not going to get the point. And what Newton is telling us is override that tendency. You can speak truth and you can still do it gently and you can still win. So, the Lord bears with you likewise and expects you to show tenderness to others from a sense of the much forgiveness you need yourself. In a little while, you will meet with your opponent in heaven. He will then be dearest to you than the nearest friend you have upon earth is to you now. Anticipate that period in your thoughts. And though you may find it necessary to oppose his errors, view him personally as a kindred soul with whom you are to be happy in Christ forever. Newton rule number two, be tender. No Judas kisses allowed. You've seen those a million times, haven't you? You know, wow, I really respect fill in the blank. John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, he's just such a great room. And then they rip him to shreds. They give him the Judas kiss and then the betrayal follows. John Newton would tell us, don't do that. Uh, let, let that tenderness guide you all the way through your discernment. Back to the letter. But if you look upon him as an unconverted person in a state of enmity against God and his grace, a supposition which, without good evidence, you should be very unwilling to admit. This is John Newton. He was solid. He was Mr. Amazing Grace. Did you hear what he said? If you, if you think you're dealing with somebody unconverted, you better make sure they're unconverted. And if you don't know for a fact that they're not, deal with them as they are actually saved. He's a more proper object of your compassion than of your anger. But you know who has made you to differ. If God in his sovereign pleasure has so appointed, you might have seen as he is now. And he, instead of you, might have been set for the defense of the gospel. You are both equally blind by nature. If you attend to this, you will not approach or hate him, because the Lord has been pleased to open your eyes and not his. A Newton rule number three, don't forget, you only know what you know because God has granted it to you. So we have got to lose the pride. Bob decided to take a winter vacation in a warmer climate, so he went to Arizona, a discount tour, and they're on the bus driving through the desert when the, when the bus breaks down. They're thinking, wow, we don't even have a radio. We better start walking. So Bob and a bunch of his fellow cheapskates, they head out into the desert and start walking when a sandstorm kicks up and all of a sudden they are scattered and lost. Bob is wandering alone in the desert. And the, the, his tongue is sticking to the roof of his mouth and all of a sudden rescue comes. They grab Bob, plug in an IV, put him into the bus, and what do you know? They run into somebody else who had been lost in the sandstorm. So they pick him up and Bob, now that his tongue isn't stuck to the roof of his mouth, uses that tarp to say, got lost in the desert? What a loser, man. Seriously. <laughs> Bob has forgotten who he is and who he was and who God has made him. Please note, the pastor who wanted to publicly challenge the other pastor was a Calvinist. The fellow that he was critiquing was an Arminian. Wow, that's fascinating, isn't it? And Newton is writing, Of all people who engage in controversy, we who are called Calvinists are most expressly bound by our own principles to the exercise of gentleness and moderation. Newton rule number four, moderation. Use the sword not to wound or kill, but to cut out falsehoods. Use it like a surgeon's scalpel. If you write with a desire of being an instrument of correcting mistakes, you will of course be cautious of laying stumbling blocks in the way of the blind or of using any expressions that may exasperate their passions. Confirm them in their principles and thereby make their conviction, humanly speaking, more impractical. Don't forget, you maybe have some things in common. So Newton rule number five, uh, motivation. Why am I writing? What do I want for this person? And then John Newton moves into consideration number two. Consider not just your opponent, but consider your audience. Every time you write a post on the internet, um, people are reading it, so you have an audience. If you have a YouTube channel, if you blog, um, you have an audience, so you not only want to be thinking about the individual about whom you are discerning, 
But who's going to be reading this? Who's going to be seeing this? Who's going to be hearing this in church or in Sunday school? John Newton. First, such as differ from you in principle. Uh, agree with the other guy, but these are, these, are, these are people that you disagree with. So you're considering your audience. These are people who don't agree with you. Second, there will be likewise many who pay little regard to religion, to have any settled system of their own. These are very incompetent judges of doctrine, but they can form a tolerable judgment of a writer's spirit. They know that meekness, humility, and love are the characteristics of a Christian temper. They always expect such dispositions as correspond with the precepts of the gospel. They are quick-sighted to discern when we deviate from such a spirit and avail themselves of it to justify their contempt of our arguments. This is John Newton. The issue is Calvinism versus Arminianism. And John Newton is not focusing on the theological dispute. He's focusing on the consideration of what we're trying to do, who we're writing about, and then who's going to be watching this. And he's, he's warning this pastor, the people who aren't very good discerners, they, but they do discern something, heart, temperament. And if we do not model that sort of fruit, they just, nope, that's just those conservative Bible banging wing nuts. I want nothing to do with them because they are able to know and discern hearts. John Newton, the scriptural maxim that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God is verified by daily observation. If our zeal is embittered by expressions of anger, invective, scorn, we may think we're doing a service of the cause of truth when in reality we shall only bring it into discredit. Those are the different types of people, but there's a third camp, third class of readers, those who actually agree with you. Now this is becoming a tightrope. You may be instrumental to their edification if the law of kindness as well of truth regulates your pen. Otherwise, you may do them harm. John Newton saying, don't forget, you're going you're to have people who are on your side, and we can have a tendency uh, to play to that side of the house. He said, be careful of that because you might actually harm them because they might develop a critical spirit of superiority in their discernment and judgment. He continues, whatever it be that makes us trust in ourselves that we are comparatively wiser good so as to treat those with contempt who do not subscribe to our doctrines or follow our party is a proof and fruit of a self-righteous spirit. Self-righteousness can feed upon doctrines as well upon works. And a man may have the heart of a Pharisee while his head is stored with orthodox notions. The best of men are not wholly free from this leaven and therefore are too apt to be pleased with such representations as hold up their adversaries to ridicule and by consequence flatter our own superior judgments. Newton rule number seven, no contempt, no ridicule. Satire and sarcasm might be employed. Paul most certainly did in 2 Corinthians 7 elsewhere, but that's like, if you want a textbook on sarcasm, it's 2 Corinthians 7. It can be used, but we do need to remember it is a serrated edge. It can shred. So we want to use satire and sarcasm as needed, as necessary, but as also delicately as possible. The third group of people that John Newton encourages us to consider before engaging publicly, guess who? You. Consider yourself. It seems a laudable service to defend the faith once delivered to the saints or commanded to contend earnestly for it and to convince gainsayers. If ever such defenses were seasonable and expedient, they appear to be so in our own day when errors abound on all sides and every truth of the gospel is either directly denied or grossly misrepresented. Um, this is Newton slash Friel rule number eight. Uh, don't let all of the errors inflate your judgment of this particular issue. You might be dealing with somebody who has lots of problems, but if you're addressing one, be careful that the other ones uh, don't inform your attitude, your heart, or the severity of your words. In other words, deal with them one at a time. In other words, uh, don't be perpetually angry because this person is just so wrong. Be a Christian who is typically for, not against, we should be the people, we should known, be known for what we're for, and then we should deal with the things that we're against. Uh, a mule can pull or kick, 
but they can't do it simultaneously. Typically, we're the pulling people. Occasionally, we need to kick. John Newton, and yet we find but very few writers of controversy who have not been manifestly hurt by it. Either they grow in a sense of their own importance or imbibe an angry, contentious spirit or they insensibly withdraw their attention from which those things, which are the food and immediate support of the life of faith, and spend their time and strength upon matters which are at most but of a secondary value. We can judge secondary things, but let's not camp there. Newton rule number nine, what level of disagreement is this? Do I really need to say something? Consider the issue. Where does it fall? Do theological triage. What are we talking about here? Are we talking about damnable heresy? Are we talking about confusion? Are we talking about ignorance? Are we talking about a difference of application? Newton is telling us, make sure you remember that. This shows, he writes, that if the service is honorable, it is dangerous. What will it profit a man if he gains his cause and silences his adversary, if at the same time he loses that humble, tender frame of spirit in which the Lord delights and to which the promise of his presence is made? Newton rule number 10, discernment is necessary, but it is downright dangerous. Your aim, I doubt not, is good, but you have need to watch and pray for you will find Satan at your right hand to resist you. He will try to debase your views. And though you've set out in defense of the cause of God, if you are not continually looking to the Lord to keep you, it may become your own cause and awaken in you those tempers which are inconsistent with true peace of mind and will surely obstruct communion with God. Newton rule number 11, Satan is warring against you when you discern. So rely on the Lord, keep your eyes on him. Fix them. Don't do this by your own power. Newton gives us one more rule. Be upon your guard against admitting anything personal into the debate. If you think you've been ill-treated, you will have an opportunity of showing that you are a disciple of Jesus, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, and when he suffered, he threatened not. And this is our pattern, that we are to speak and write for God, not rendering railing for railing, but contrawise blessing, knowing that this is what we are called to. The wisdom that is from above is not only pure, but peaceable and gentle. And the want of these qualifications, like the dead fly in the pot of ointment, will spoil the savor and efficacy of our labors. Newton rule number 12, remove yourself, especially if you've been slighted, especially if you've been offended. Uh, perhaps you've been called a pejorative. That has to go away because that's not the issue. We need to remove ourselves because we're not the point, are we? <laughs> God and his truth, they are the point. So we need to go forth, he closes, and this will be our close. Go forth in the name and strength of the Lord of hosts, speaking the truth in love, and may he give you a witness in many hearts that you are taught of God and favored with the unction of his Holy Spirit. Those are the rules of publicly discerning. John Newton, not only a good hymn writer, really good theologian, wise fellow. And I would like to suggest to you, we all do well to consider Newton's rules so that we don't end up like a man who's been on a deserted island for 20 years. One day, the rescuers come on shore and they ask the fellow who'd been there by himself for two decades, hey, why do you have three huts? What is that all about? And he said, well, the first hut, oh, that's my house. Second hut, that's my church. The third hut, that's my old church. Discuss. There are churches in the Middle East. Sadly, their pulpits are weak. It is devastating to the church when a pastor does not know how to preach because the pulpit leads the church. If a pulpit is weak, then the church is weak. And if the pulpit is strong, the church is strong. Would you please help strengthening pulpits around the globe by supporting the Master's Academy International at wretched.org pastor.